Well, that's good. I mean, you just look, you know, you look just so healthy. I don't know what's, what it is. I've been eating too much. I, I even have Pepsi over here. So <laughs> uh, that's just uh, showing, uh, you, you know, entering life, I guess. <laughs> I guess. You know, yeah. We had a, a dream with, uh, uh, oh, this was this cool dream. Uh, Charles, you know, is in Maine right now and he's, uh, He's uh, working at the at a park there, and uh, he had uh, this dream of these children who were trapped on this endless plane that was covered with spiders and snakes, you know. And uh, uh, so finally, they they can't do anything; they can't move at all. So they faint, and then somebody brings them over, or the life force. He says the life force which is the great mother, brings from the devouring mother, the feel of the devouring mother. She rescues them to the uh, uh, to a, a place of, of safety away from the devouring mother, the great mother. And uh, I asked Charles, what does this mean? Do you think? He says, it just means don't be afraid of life. You know? And I said, that really nails it because it was this, that's, uh, if you ever heard this song uh, or song, by Carmina Barana, by Carl Orff. You know, it's this, it's sort of a choral thing, but I mean, the, the whole, at the crescendo, these animas, uh, women are saying, Venni, 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 come, come, come. You know, and then, then it says, uh, um, it says, uh, hail world so rich in joy, I will always be sir, uh, I, I will always, um, let's see, hail world so rich in joy. I will always be your servant through love of you. You know, uh, so it's just this beautiful aspect of coming into life. But I mean, I think Kevin, you you seem like you really are, are uh, I mean, you're a different person than, than. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I've been studying Japanese. And uh, like for a few months now, I think seven months, I haven't really uh, gone into dream interpretation, but this last week it has, it has gone back to that, which mm -hmm. I, yeah, but I'm, uh, yeah, but I'm always afraid to start again because, uh, you know, I don't want to lose the no, Japanese. No, I light. don't think, so I'm think trying to, yeah. I agree yeah, with so. you. I mean, it is, it yeah. is a time, uh, you, you know, um, this, this one thing is, uh, in here, uh, say, you know, that Freudian psychology is about persona adaptation, you know, and see, mm -hmm. this is, this is what, uh, again, Charles, you know, had the same problem, but, you know, he's running on all fours, sees this beautiful woman, and then the old great mother asks him, are you interested in that girl? And he says, yeah. And then she says, well, you need a new suit of clothes. You know, you need mm. uh, new clothes before you can do it. In other words, you need a, a better persona adaptation to yeah. participate in the outer world. And, and that's kind of, I think, what you seem to be doing. And you don't want to go back to the level of where you're not building the persona, you know, strengthening yeah. the persona. You know, so yeah, I, mean, definitely. I, I know um, exactly what's been going on. Uh, I mean, it's been, yeah. but it, it's, it's, it's just absolutely visible in just your face and your, uh, mm. everything you're doing. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, how's the career going? It's going fine. I don't really, um, how do you say, I don't really build a career, like even at work, like yeah. uh, I had opportunities many times, but I'm just focused on, um, yeah, I'm focused on um, a Japanese right now, and yeah, well, that's yeah, great. it's it's the, an, the it's the anima that drives me right now, and yeah, so I'm a bit afraid of the wise yeah. old man. He's catching up in my dreams, but uh, I'll see if I can put time for both. Yeah, well, that's great. Uh, um, Jap Japan, if I was if I was uh, yeah, if you learn Japanese, I mean that's the place to go. I mean, especially in the Philippines. Hi, Jan, yeah, just... and. And Gary, how are you doing? 
Uh, you had just a, a moon meditation. I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm doing good. You know, it's like, you know, the unfortunate thing is she does those on Wednesdays, so that interferes oh, okay. with, the, with the dream group, you know? I know. Well, I, it's more important. It's far more important. <laughs> you know? But yeah, well, things are good. Yeah, and we're almost finished with this Puer Eternus book. Uh, you know, we're going to, uh, I mean, we only got one more lecture after this, tw number 12. I mean, her chapter 12, she, she calls the lecture 12. And then, you know, I, I'm kind of open to what we do next, but I thought we might want to, I mean, here are just some suggestions, you know, The Anima and Animus by Emma Young. It's a short book, but, you know, it's one that would, really uh, be impactful. And then also I thought, um, you know, just looking at um, some of the uh, alchemical uh, uh, things in, in that book by Edinger, I, I forget what it's called. It's, you know, something about alchemy, but it's, uh, you, know, you know, it's just basically about salutio, uh, coagulatio, mm -hmm. um, Mortificatio, conjunctio, and also about yeah. the prima materia. Thought we'd just kind of cover the highlights of that, you know, and uh, it is not that it's so fascinating and interesting, but it's just a, a real, uh, you know, help uh, to dream interpretation, really. But, you know, whatever. Hi, Jordy and Carlos. Yeah, we're. Um, just uh, going to finish a lecture 11 here and uh, just some important points. I mean, essentially it's, um, you know, the collective versus the personal anatomy of the psyche. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Jordi. I won't be able to stay until then because it's Sunday evening here yeah. and uh, my agenda is complicated, but I'll do my best. Okay, well, thank you. It's just good. It's great to always see you, Jordi. And a rem a rem oh, it's a pleasure. A reminder, you know, when you met a pilot, the first thing he says is he shows it that he's a pilot. Yes, <laughs> the right. first thing he says. No. Yes, no. there you are. You've got it on your shirt. You look yeah. like you're losing weight, too. You're getting. Well, I am training very seriously uh, four or five times a week in the last two days. Yeah. Well, I mean, you just look much more slender, you know, so yeah. that's, that's, uh, for, I, for, you know, uh, what my, um, my aunt, my mother's sister used to call us youngsters under 60 yeah. and we're no longer youngsters under 60 anymore. So. <laughs> well, we, we, we are youngsters a slightly above 60. Yes. Young, youngsters under we, 70. I say no. 60 something. Yes. 60 something. There you go. Well, well, now, where we're going to the topic of today it's one. It's a multi-layer topic because it's simple, the the personal and the collective, but it's like a ten-floor mine. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, it is vertical well, what, what, or connections, which is kind of tricky. Huh? Def well, definitely, but she's 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 contrasting. Um, you know, uh, the, we're, we're, we're going to just keep, cover the collective versus the personal. And then we're going to go, go over that judgment aspect, which is, and the execution and living in an I thou world versus an I it world. And then what it means to be, uh, what it means to be um, crucified by in, in a red royal garment or a black garment, you know, and uh then the, the problem of the slippers, uh, the power versus love. They, they go together. You know, hi, Miles. Just getting started here. And then, uh, and then the wolf, which comes right after he sees the white bird, you know, which saved him from the execution. Suddenly the wolf comes, which is this enantiodromia. But anyway, let's just uh, quickly... Uh, just go over the difference between the power, uh, the uh, uh, the collective and the personal. Uh, you know, foe represents the uh, evolutionary aspect of, of the mother and the boys, where uh, von Spat is related to the um, uh, to the world of the uh, uh, 
um, of 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 the uh, of the collective religion, and it's just very interesting. This uh, the pairs, you know, von Spat re represents stars, feminine, and music. So it's the abstract uh, to some extent, where faux represents the imminence of the mother realm, and that's really is also somewhat represents this connection to life. You know, the great mother is the animating force of life. She's nature too, you know. And then spiritualization, which is separated from the earth and trees which are rooted in it. This, the foe is the evolutionary aspect of the personal uh, way. And von Spat is the aspect of the collective way. You know, and then von Spat is related to the realm of ghosts, where foe is related to the realm of animals and body. You know, and then von Spat is related to power and order, and foe is represented not power and order, but the the evolutionary and the revolutionary uh, aspects of the uh, of, of the religion. You know, and uh, what she says here, we'll just finish this, this is kind of a review from last time, but um, she says that, um, you know, that, that what, what some people are starting to do with von Spat is trying to find uh, what, what happens when foe appears, he suddenly tells us what von Spat is. And, we t and what we find in von Spat is a conventional Weltanschauung worldview, which is really not, um, helpful to anyone anymore because nobody knows what it means. And then also it says uh, it's somewhat empty. What was the mystery behind this before? And she says some people are, are trying to, uh, Toynbee, write poem, uh, prayers that say, O Dar, though thou who art Buddha, Christ, and Dionysus. But she says this attempt at relativity really doesn't have a, a chance of success, she says, because it's more of an intellectual experience or a mood that you feel. And it's not something that pervades everything, that changes your whole life. It's a total experience and is applicable to every field of activity. So this attempt to try to make Christian Christianity more relative because you know more about religions uh, elsewhere is not really uh, going to be successful, she says, because it's a mood. And, an, and she says, you only bring it out of the uh, drawers on Sundays or, you know, for intellectual discussion what religion is, where she's saying that a, a real religion now almost has to be the individual, uh, absolute obligation of the individual that they get through their dreams because the, the collective really isn't um, serving it, you know, and uh, I'm sure you all have different uh, ones. I mean, here's, here's one I had, you know, a couple days ago, you know, of the of this in the realm of the body, this white uh, an uh, antelope appears, a white gazelle, and it, it dances. And uh, so in this realm of body, all the uh, aspects of flesh of the world, and it's being, um, you know, uh, manned by these two elfin me old men, you know, this comes up. Now, you, you know, the only thing is that's, not applicable to you. It's, but to me, it, it is something I need to assimilate and try to find out what it means. So, you know, genuine ex religious experience cannot be collective. It needs to be valid for us personally. And she says, this is the crucial point of the whole novel that um, a foe represents the new evolutionary religious experience that has come up because of the of the death of, of the of the way that von Spat is so rigid and and fixed, you know, and uh, uh, so that um, is. Uh, but the, but the problem is 
two, that the one thing, uh, that, that that's a very good sentiment, you know, but the, the problem in, in, uh, in Bruno Getz, who really is Melchior, is uh, what's going to come up next in his judgment, you know, that he, there's no feminine aspect in his uh, world. Uh, it's just the, 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 the Senex world of Von Spat and the uh, realm of the Puer of Melchior. And the only feminine presence in it is a, a, a poisonous uh, feminine, you know, some kind of either the devouring mother or the addictive witch, you know, and what sh it should look like is this, you know, uh, that von Spat should be related to the mother anima, to life. You know, the wise old man and life should be one pole. The other pole should be uh, our, our destiny, our life, and, uh, and, and our relationship in the case of uh, man to a young anima, the transformation of new birth, and it produces either the outer child or the inner child. But uh, Melchior and Bruno get sort of end up here. You know, they don't really have this aspect, you know, which is, is somewhat similar to Exupery as well. And hi, Arpane, nice to uh, see you. We're just, we're covering kind of a review hi. of that. Yes. Hi. Good morning, or whatever it is there. I guess it's good afternoon. It's evening. <laughs> yes, evening. Yeah. Good evening. Okay. Good day. Yes. All right. Well, anyway, that's the critical point of the novel. And then we're going to get into that next. Uh, okay. She she has this, uh, or he has this uh, aspect of the critical point of the novel is this uh, doubleness of von Spat that, that crystallizes because of the appearance of the opposite pole, which is foe, which represents the Puer world. And then von Spat suddenly becomes doubled. He becomes uh, the, the Senex world. And then that unknown mystery that lies behind it, which we don't know what it is, you know? And uh, so, uh, then, so then he has this judgment scene where, you know, he knocks on the door goes into the realm of Van, Von Spat, and then suddenly everybody he knows are lined up on two sides of a courtroom. There's three judges and they're all dead except him. And they all tell him what was wrong with him. You know, like his wife says, I embroidered a, uh, took me a year to embroider some slippers for you and you just toss them away. And then his, his, uh, Professor Cox says that he only was interested in his work, was never interested in Professor Cox's work. And then Trumpelsteg tells him that he would steal his ideas and not be grateful. And then his old aunt tells him that uh, he, uh, um, she would read him her most secret poems and he would uh, uh, just laugh at, he thought they were dumb, you know. And so that all, everything she loves died with her because she couldn't share it with him, you know? And so then at the end, um, you know, he says that they can't judge him. He's this intellectual, cool intellectual person in this realm of feelings and relatedness. All the accusations against him are of his lack of relatedness. And so then they tell him, the judges tell him that you must die, okay? And so, the first thing they do is nail a black cloak onto him, nail it on, you know, and then uh, they're about ready to cut his head off and a white uh, bird flies above, which represents the spiritual realm. He gets up his courage, grabs the sword from, from the executioner, kills him, escapes, and then that world is just flushed out. The world of his guilt is flushed out by a wave of the unconscious. And then Von Spat comes and tells him uh, that you did a very good job of, uh, of uh, you know, not falling in for this uh, 
uh, mere guilt, you know. So, so the question comes up, you know, about the unrelatedness and, and, and how the unrelatedness aspect is the missing two parts of that circle, you know. The eros and the anima are missing. And, and this cold intellect is saying, um, you know, it's using this spiritual trick. You know, it's saying, oh, that's just my mere inferiority feelings and dismisses them, you know, totally dismisses them. And uh, so this complete uh, cold narcissism uh, just uh, dismisses it, poo-poos it. You know, now just some, uh, uh, without the, with the lack of differentiation of the anima and without any relationship to the feminine principle, uh, this, um, uh, that's, that's what he's guilty of. And uh, yet he just dismisses it with this spiritual, a uh, false spiritual elation, you know. And so now she's going through how we don't, how do we escape our guilt? In this case, it's the guilt of, of uh, unrelatedness. And uh, um, she says there's two ways to escape it. And uh, one, is, oh, well, first of all, before we get to that, um, it, it, what does it mean to be uh, beheaded? You know, it's going to be beheaded. That means that um, he's going to be de-intellectualized. And so he needed to go through that execution. And uh, that would have then opened up the Eros world to him, the Eros and the anima. It, not if it was a physical de-intellectualization, but if it was actual de-intellectualization, that's what's wrong with him. And so uh, he, um, uh, so, so his escape is from his de-intellectualization. <laughs> So that's not really uh, solving the problem. It's actually just leaving that ellipse with, with no uh, feminine aspect. And um, she, she goes in uh, through that, that this seems to be somewhat of an execution uh, that is a crucifixion, really. It's related to, uh, to the, um, the, the, the uh, cr uh, to Christ crucifixion his execution, but it's a reverse execution. And so she says, the intellect uh, calls these feelings of guilt, of unrelatedness, that calls them morbid guilt. And she says, morbid guilt does exist. It exists in the animus in a woman and it exists in uh, the, the poisonous mother anima of a man and which can torture them to death, you know, but um, the, the mother anima poison, uh, is, is she says, is the inflation of, of um, guilt. So she says there's two ways not to become conscious of, become conscious and realize the guilt of unrelatedness. And one is this, um, the elation, spiritual elation, false spiritual elation. You're unrelated. That's your problem. Okay, well, I think I'll just go do a, uh, uh, go, go do some, to some uh, uh, ashram and do some meditations. Well, that doesn't address the problem. And then the other, that was what, um, what Melchior does. And that's what kind of what Bruno Getz does. But then there's the other aspects, which she says is the, uh, the one of this, um, wallowing in it emotionally. And she says, uh, you say, you say, I am the greatest sinner in the world and I'm now suffering for my sins. And uh, she says, even Christ, he has a royal red garment. It's the royal garment of sin, you know, and then he wears a, uh, a crown of thorns uh, where in the case uh, of where, where he's not uh, saying I'm the greatest sinner who have ever lived. And she says that's an inflation. And it's also an inflation to, uh, uh, to um, you know, here, here's a, a, 
the, she says the inflation is, I'm the greatest sinner in the world. I'm the most miserable sinner. Have have uh, comfort me, you know. I mean, that's the way you escape the the uh, something like this, you know. I don't know if you guys remember this, but it's you know Jimmy Swaggered, uh, you know, gets caught with, you know, it was just a, a idea of he got caught with prostitution, and so he this was his method of of this emotional wallowing in the guilt, but he's not really addressing the problem of the 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 in this case that aspect of unrelatedness of of not being related to of, of being this intellectual person who lives in this has come up several times in the i it world does not live in the i thou world you know and it just um you you know it just uh, reminded me a lot of 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 the antidote for that you know is like uh martin buber you know, uh, uh, you know, he says like this, the world is not comprehensible, but it is embraceable to the embracing of one of its beings, you know, uh, and uh, uh, there's, th this is the, um, this is the wisdom way of relating to, um, to, uh, you, you know, I do indeed at sometimes surrender myself to a book, but only because I can open the door and see a human face looking at me, you know? And uh, I mean, it's just this uh, re realizing that the, the primary realm is um, the, the realm of, uh, uh, of, of relatedness. All real life is encounter of the I thou. All real life is relatedness. And she says, the salvation of man does not lie, lie in his holding himself far removed from the worldly, but in consecrating it to holy, to divine meaning. And that is this aspect of the I thou, of the relatedness of the eros, you know, which, which allows this realm to exist, you know, here. And that is... Uh, you know, this one, you know, the realm of, uh, of von Spat. Uh, and, uh, I mean, and with the mother wisdom, the old uh, wise man with the mother wisdom, that is wholeness. That is the conscious realization of the fact that, uh, that he's unrelated uh, to uh, uh, the world, and that is his guilt, you know. But it is a, one, a wonderful... She says that the black, um, where Christ was, she says the aspect of, of facing the guilt of the world, you know, I don't know, really know, she didn't really say anything about it, but the, the aspect of this, um, uh, of, of the, inf uh, of inflating it is not be really becoming conscious of it, you know, becoming conscious of it. And of course, that's related with our own, the fact that we need a, a a um, uh, to have a relationship to the uh, uh, individual realm and not the collective. Having a great relation to the collective is is very hard to uh, fathom uh, what it means. You know. Um, now let, let's just talk about the slippers because this is pretty interesting. Uh, you know, uh, it, she took a whole year to embrace. Uh, to uh, embroider them, and she gave a lot of love to it, and Melchior just kicks them away. It shows his stark unrelatedness. And this is kind of a, a surprise to me for of Sophia that she did do this. She's, I did not know that she loved him that much, but um, she says this is kind of the trick of the of the poer or the intellectual um, that they. Um, they look at a woman and they see her sometimes do some trick, you know, and then so at that point, they say all she is is tricks. But the, the problem is he's so flighty, you know, that um, a woman has, um, you know, she's very beautiful and she possesses 
uh, power because of her beauty. And uh, yet she also is Eros. She represents the principle of love. And so she, he, she says in more unconscious women, uh, the power principle and the love principle often are not separated very well, you know, but um, it is an aspect of what a women that they have both of them. And if you are a very flighty person, you invite that uh, power principle, which is the one of the devouring mother where she needs to imprison you because you don't respond to her, to her love, you know, and, uh, uh, it, it just reminded me very much of, uh, uh, of uh, Scarlett O'Hara and uh, uh, Rhett Butler. You know, I mean, it was just this relationship between the very flighty Rhett Butler and this Scarlett O'Hara, who's all tricks, you know, an all power principle. And what, um, you know, uh, uh, what um, melt? What a a someone who's differentiated the anima, and has differentiated eros, is going to recognize that, and yet is not going to uh, make a big deal about it. You know, I mean, I I just thought I'd show this real quick. Wait, just a second. I'm going to share it. Just a second. It's just really. Take me a second here. Okay. All right. <laughs> you don't have any audio. Oh, there's no audio. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know how to do it. I, I would need... Uh... Anyway, it's just, uh, she says, frankly, my dear, I don't give it. I can't do it. Uh, I'd I need... Uh, if, uh, if you go under share screen, yeah, there's a box on the bottom that says share computer sound. Oh, yeah. Will... Okay. All right. Yeah. Let me try it one then more you'll have it. Okay. It, It's worth seeing. It's, it's just so beautiful. And really, it does... Uh, absolutely represent uh, this aspect of the flightiness of the uh, of the of the the puer who Rhett Butler is really is a puer. Uh, let me see here, uh, you know, and uh, let me see if I can get that. Now, wait, I think I have to. Where is it? Show the sound aspect here. All right, I think I have to go here. Okay, share sound. All right, let's see. All right, let's see. Multiple just advanced sharing options. Uh, all right, well, I don't know. Maybe you can show it. Uh, <laughs> I can put the link in the uh, in the uh, chat. I can't do it, but but it just is is this this is really shows the uh, aspect. Of Rhett Butler is this puer aspect. Maybe if you can do it, Gary, I just put the link in the. Yeah, let's see. But, and Scarlett O'Hara is this one who's very beautiful. And yet the, the beautiful woman has power, you know. And yet, how does she relate to this flighty aspect of the male who does not uh, return her love, you know? Her only uh, alternative is to use the power principle to uh, to um, imprison him, and so uh, in in the case of Melchior, he invites this from women. He invites the devouring mother uh, archetype to appear in every woman he meets because he does he has not um, differentiated the anima enough to. Uh, to uh, be able to um, uh, distinguish between the two, you know. But anyway, it's just a wonderful image for us to remember is that um, to have, that, that there's, there is this aspect to love. And it's not the women, he, she says the women 
can't help themselves. They're automatically need to do that. But then the puer says, oh, you're just all tricks, you know, and so I'm not. So they throw the love aspect out. But now what if Rhett Butler had said, oh, Scarlett, I know you're all full of tricks, but I'm going to overlook that. I'm going to ignore that aspect of you. And then that shows that he recognizes that. And then he can differentiate her, you know. And so this is why uh, Melchior, and I, I'm assuming also, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bruno Getz uh, could not relate uh, to the feminine very well, you know, because of, of that. It's no excuse to reject the whole thing, you know. Uh, but that's the meaning of the slippers, you know, aspect. Well, anyway, um, we're going to go on to the next part, unless, Gary, you can get that thing going. Uh, Rhett did not, uh, did for a while, but then he lost sight. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, she just, he got tired of her uh, power play. And if you remember, what she eventually does is she devotes herself to Tara, to the, to the land, to home, you know, and maybe that was her, uh, the way she redeemed herself. But then we're going to come up uh, after, right after all these, um, these aspects. Okay, I think Gary's got it here. Red, 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 you go. What shall I go? What shall I do? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. It's just beautiful, you know, it really is uh, just a beautiful, and it really tells us a lot about, and now remember she says in the more unconscious woman, the power principle and the love principle are almost impossible to in disentangle, you know, but then the man who is not differentiated and doesn't, uh, can't see that here she's using the power principle, I can accommodate that. You know, but what I'm really after is her love, you know, because that's what I lack, you know. So that's the differentiated aspect where Melchior just sees, and, and this is what Marie-Louise von Franz says, if you are devoted to the principle of yes or no, to either or, she says, you can never relate to women and you can never uh, be analyzed either. She says, you can't uh, individuate because you are, I mean, you can't relate to the unconscious. So you can't relate to the anima, you can't relate to the outer woman, you can't relate to, uh, to the unconscious. You know? and, that, and that clip we just watched, was the power principle her trying to trap him by her neediness? Um, I think what, what, she, what he, you're, you're seeing two things here. One is his flightiness, the fact that he, she has been being very abusive to him with the power principle uh, through the whole movie, you know, running hot and cold all the time and, you know, basically wanting money pretty much. And, you know, because she didn't have any, you know, and he had lots. So, I mean, he was, she, so she finds out, first of all, she's trying to trap him from his, for his money. But then she finds out that she actually does love him, you know, and she wants to get him back, you know. But uh, Rhett is more after just her beauty, but isn't really too concerned with her essence, her soul, you know. So it's, it's where she, he's captivated by her beauty. He, she's captivated by his wealth. And, uh, and then he's also very flighty. He goes everywhere. You know, he's fly, you know, he just, he comes in and out, you know, and, and doesn't, never settles down. And wasn't, they, they didn't, they have a daughter and then she died. She was killed on the horse. Uh, and that was sort of a, you know, not a good thing. You know, uh, that was, I think, also an aspect of that their daughter uh, died in a horse. Yeah, Bonnie. Yeah, it just chokes me up to hear me. But anyway, um, uh, where uh, that that's true, but uh, I, I, I it is it's I'm a little uh, you know I'm always a softy. 
Well, anyway, now we're going to get to the aspect right after the, um, I, I want to turn it over to for discussion at 11.45 to uh, Gary, and Gary can do anything he wants for the rest of the time, and I'll participate as well, but it's, Gary's going to run the discussion. But uh, it, it, what happens, there's two, two things that it happened in that last part that she reads before the, uh, uh, the really bizarre last <laughs> chapter where uh, Fo gets a spear in the chest and everything. But uh, there is this uh, um, aspect of the wolves come. This is right after he escapes from the, uh, from the, uh, uh, the execution through the white bird who is the messenger of von Spat, you know? And so then he's sitting in nature all alone and he's surrounded by all these uh, uh, wolves. Night comes on and he hears the howling of the wolf. And in the light of the stars, he sees shadows. And soon he sees a ring of wolves surrounds him. Terrified, he stops. Each time he moves, they snarl. But when he keeps perfectly still, they do not attack. So he sits there, does not know whether he sat for hours or minutes. He looks towards the horizon uh, where the sun is slowly rising. And at that moment, tears come into his eyes. He sees the light coming and stretches out his arms towards it. And the wolves disappear like clouds. So the, if you can't relate, she says, you can only be eaten, you know, so he escapes the realm of the execution for his unrelatedness. So now he's going to be eaten by the wolves. And uh, uh, he, he escapes that again. It's the realm of the devouring mother. And uh, uh, that um, because he has no love, she, uh, you, know, you know, if you can't, I can't make him love me. I need, I will devour him, you know. I, uh, through the power complex or, or something else, but it's also the, the, uh, the wolf um, is, is, has a head of iron, you know, I mean, another, there's no softness in it. So it's also represents sometimes the God of death, the abyss of death, the jowering, devouring jaw. It, and, and it also stands for a drivenness in wanting to have things but with no further purpose, you know, and uh, uh, this is um, uh, often rep recognized or in um, the dragon who, um, who has his, his lair is filled with gold and with a beautiful, beautiful women. And he has no use for either one of them, you know? So this is the aspect of the wolf, this uh, ravenous aspect of it just wants more and more and more. And she says that this often comes up in um, children who were starved with, uh, from, with, or deprived of love or some other vital psychological need. They have this demonic, uh, divine demonic quality. She says uh, that they... Um, uh, that they have a, at the base of their souls, this just this petrified, frozen and cold rage where uh, they very much become the name of, uh, of uh, the wolf uh, that belonged to Wotan was Isengrim, which meant iron head. And they really do have an iron head. You know, uh, they just... Um, uh, you, you know, they have no, at the, at, at their very base, they can uh, just write anybody off. There is a, a, a level of them where they are, um, have, you know, I uh, remembered when she said this too, uh, this was uh, something in uh, David Lynch had uh, one time called the angriest dog in the world, you know, uh, the dog who's so angry, he cannot move, he cannot eat, he cannot sleep. He can just barely growl, bound uh, so tightly uh, with venom and anger. Uh, he approaches the street 
a, a state of rigor mortis. And then he had a lot of, of cartoons on that. And here's the dog outside and the uh, people in the house. There's usually a reason for everything. And then there's the next panel and the next panel. And then everybody goes to bed, but the dog itself never changes, you know. But the, the idea is that um, Melchior was deprived of this love. He was, um, his, he was so lonely, he saw his double at the window, you know, which sort of uh, opened up this, developed his wolfish greed, and he tries to hold it in, but eventually it comes out with his terrible, impossible demands. And then uh, we'll finish. Uh, um, chapter 12 is the last section of the book, but um, we do have a few. Oh, we got plenty of time. I, I thought we'd just um, finish with this other aspect uh, of this lecture. I think it, all of it's very interesting. I don't know if I can make it interesting, but um, here, here's the part that swap after, after the wolves. Uh, toward midday, he came into a fog smelling of mold and decay. He cannot see well, but he arrives at a kind of a wooden fence. He goes into a courtyard overgrown with grass in the middle of which is a tumble-down hut full of people with bird-like hooked noses and piercing eyes who are selling large yellow mushrooms with green spots. The sun is shining on them, but a yellow mist rises from them, and there's a strange smell. The people say, please buy mu the mushrooms. They are the last. The earth is dissolving into mist. The sun rots. Buy mushrooms as long as there are any. The woods are dying. The world is exploding. Bargains, good bargains. He turns faint in the mist and feels heavier and heavier, still feeling the wounds from the black coat on his shoulder. He walks among them. It looks as though the whole earth were covered with dirt and mold. He hears uncontrollable feminine laughter and turns around and sees the old apple woman among the people too, dancing completely naked making indecent gestures. She too cries, buy mushrooms, buy mushrooms. They are the last, buy as long as there are any. The earth molds and the sun rots, the woods die, the world explodes, bargains, good bargains. And then the last part, then a handsome, sensuous uh, looking young woman who also makes indecent gestures uh, and is quite naked join in. They surround Melchior more and more closely. He, he does escape them, you know, and, and then it sort of ends up, he, he goes into the crystalline castle of Melchior. He uh, picks up Melchior's magic wand, his black cloak falls off and his wounds heal. And that's what tied him to the earth, by the way, the wounds. And uh, he sees all these petrified, immobilized boys and uh, uh, one of them is foe. He uh, suddenly uh, uh, thinks, uh, joins them, and then they uh, leave. Don't you want to go away from here? He is here. Foe is here. And he says, I want to go away. And um, he feels the arms of the boy seizing him. Somebody kisses him on the lips, and everything vanishes. So uh, anyway, uh, that this is the, uh, after falling into the half wrong feelings of guilt, pulled away with a wrong, a kind of wrong spiritualization, he falls into the wolves, goes into the crystalline palace. And uh, so uh, he really never uh, resolves the problem of the relatedness, you know, so he's just oscillating between that ellipse of the, uh, of the Psenix and the Puer. And he really never finds the relatedness, you know. But um, she does do a little bit about the great mother and the mushrooms and the Kabiri, you know, the mush uh, mushrooms. The world is decaying. Uh, nature, this, this type of realm is unhealthy, sickly nature, morbid, and the sensuality is morbid. And so she's saying the mushrooms represent sort of a false way of healing uh, this psychotropic medicine the drugs from the fungus you know uh that um 
what people do is is they uh, you know you know she says that all feelings of totality have a, an emotional aspect and but through the uh through the mushrooms you can uh, uh, somewhat achieve the madness without the emotion you know uh, what what she's saying is the world of madness that that you've got two as two oscillation poles you've got the world of normality where there is no emotion and then you've got the world of of madness where their emotion just runs amok which was this the kabiri and all these uh, wild women so you got the world of normality where there is no emotion that's on spat's world and then you have the world of the uh these dionysian uh ceremonies that are just completely out of control well you need both those aspects because the dionysian is the one that brings new life this one here is the one <laughs> that is the restitution of order you know but you can't rest in the restitution of order forever and you can't live in the realm of this uh, madness, the totality of madness, the totality of love, the totality of anger, the totality of any emotion. If you just let yourself go into it, you know, uh, and um, so what needs to be done is Melchior needs to say, I'm not choosing the side of normality and restitution, and I'm not choosing the side of foe either. I'm going to uh, be in the middle, you know, and so I'm not in either realm, but I'm going to, uh, I, I need to dip my toe in the realm of totality. I need to visit that realm, but I need to also keep my feet on the girl. You know, I can't go, e either side is, is an inflation. She says either side is a form of madness, you know, over being overly uh, uh, non-emotional and normal is is a form of madness. Overly reasonable, overly rational, she says, is really a form of madness. And, and what it, you mean by madness it is you've 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 left your humanity. You know, you're not human anymore. So if you're not human anymore, what are you? You know, and. Uh, this is, uh, I always, if, if you ever want to know, uh, somewhat is, is the, um, you, you know, uh, the uh, aspect, I mean, I, I, you could go for, to any of Martin Buber's, but what, what you do is you make, you stand in between and you make, you make your human life the holy realm. The Dionysian life is not human. The world of normality is not human uh, over, uh, uh, but you need, you need to be informed by both. And I, I know he has, he had this one quote about the, uh, uh, about, um, I, I don't know, uh, the, the human being, uh, well, well, the I thou, you know, when I confront a human being as my thou and speak the basic I thou to him, then he is no longer a thing among things. He does, nor does he consist of things. He's no longer he or she, a dot in the world of grid and space and time, nor a condition to be experienced and described. A loose bundle of name qualities, neighborless and seamless. He is thou and fills the firmament. Now this, he's talking also about our human life. Not as if there were nothing but he, but everything else lives in his life. So what is the real uh, solution to Melchior? It's not foe and it's not von Spat. You know, the, the relationship, the, the, the saving thing is being human, you know, and, and, and having both qualities. The one of this, uh, the, of the madness of totality and emotion, not being emotionless, but also the one of order and form and restitution. And then in, and, and also of course, his, his uh, being de-intellectualized needs to be de-intellectualized because um, that is uh, uh, 
um, is is that that's what makes him so elliptical and not round. Well, anyway, um, I think that covers chapter eleven. Uh, she doesn't say anything about the wand part, and then uh, uh, about the crystalline palace and all that. Uh, but it sort of just we're just told that uh, you know he uh, goes to the crystalline palace uh, at once he has taken the wand that black cloak which is not red cloak it's the opposite of inflation it's black it's his black character which is nailed to him after that is removed suddenly he doesn't he, she, she's saying that uh, th this is one interesting that you, you know it, when we visit the unconscious and we get these wonderful visions you know uh, that we also uh, you, let's say we're moving closer and closer to individuation towards wholeness and and we start to have these absolutely fabulous visions she says sometimes we identify with them and that's inflation so the the, uh, the when we dream about thorns or wounds or actually have wounds that is to make us not inflated to realize that uh, this body we have is not the uh is not this uh divine realm it is mortal you know and that we are the mortal tabernacle of those images you know but i anyway i think that that uh this chapter gives a real uh, sort of almost uh, a little bit of a, uh, uh, it, it's very, um, gives us the overview of, of it. I, I'm, I'm anxious to hear if Janet, Jan has any comments about it. I mean, the aspect of the, uh, of where Melchior cannot be between, not choose on either side. He needs to be human in the middle. And then also the fact that, um, he needs to uh, accept the woman and her power principle and not judge her, and, uh, you, you know, to, to accept her tricks and uh, that realm. But anyway, uh, Gary, why don't I turn it over to you and you can just lead a discussion, but try to include everybody if you can and, and oh I'll gosh, participate. But I'm going to move. A, such an amazing book. Um, really liked your, your presentation of this. But, you know, I, I think the, so was, you know, was the author of this, I mean, were they Jungian or were they just like, was this just out of their unconscious? Were they just like, you know, pulling things? Uh, well, out? it's very interesting. And I think it's very related to the realm of, we have no idea what it takes to be a, a, uh, a great writer, you know. I mean, to me, a great writer is not writing any of this stuff. It just pours forth from him. And what he's doing is active imaginations. You know, I mean, you, you know, because if, if, you know, you can get a contrived novel, but I mean, one like this and one like The Little Prince, and also I'd say Thus Spake Zarathustra and some other of these, they just seem like active imaginations by someone who's very skilled at doing it, you know. So, I, I mean, the, in the case of Exupery, it was an X-ray of his neurosis. I think this one is an X-ray of, uh, of uh, Bruno Goetz's neurosis. I believe it was written during World War II, you know, and uh, uh, a run, World War I, and it was published in 1919. So it, it came out of that realm of T.S. Eliot and Brancusi and Picasso and, and uh, James Joyce and Thomas Mann and, you know, all of this. And Freud and Young and Einstein and, and Niels Bohr and all these other uh, great uh, people who came suddenly exploded out of 1913. You know, I mean, just like uh, uh, just a, a explosion of... of of newness in every field, absolutely revolutionary newness that threw away the old forms and, you know, made new ones. 
you know, the could Dadaists. You, you, could you provide the link to the uh, Dropbox PDF for this again? Oh, yeah, certainly. That would be, that would be really good. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I know, it, it's just. Yeah, if anyone else wants to speak to that, I'm, I'm about to the, the mystery of the great writer, you know, Herman Hesse or anyone, I mean, uh, or even the great uh, composer, the great musical composer, or the great uh, artist, or uh, the great dancer. Uh, do you think uh, uh, Rudolf Nureyev, you know, just um, there's much intellectualizing in what he does? I don't know, you know. But yeah, I'll get the link, uh, Gary. Gary but yeah, just, but I mean, you know, know, it just it just feels like art on, you know, paper instead of a painting. You know, it's, it's just with words. It's just so. Anyway, I don't know. Let's let's go around, Kevin. Why don't you uh, give us uh, your input on this? Yeah, um, I feel it's um, a very difficult topic, um, uh, being individual, because um, this is about the the midpoint. You know, not being confined to the collective consciousness and not also being confined to the collective unconsciousness. But most people don't even know the concept of uh, collective unconsciousness. And so whether we want it or not, we, we will be unconscious more or less you know, if we are too confined in collective consciousness. So so my why I'm mentioning this because <laughs> that, okay, so I'm mentioning this because the, the very thing that has defined the collective unconscious is union work. But most union analysts is in you know on their own individuation process, which often also more an introverted process. So the rest is left to themselves basically, uh, more or less, because you know, how many unions do you see on YouTube, for example, do dream analysis or talk about uh, archetypes and so on without it costing money. We have to be honest, it costs quite a lot of money just to, to yeah, just see half an hour and so on. And so I feel like um, there's something which is not quite right, I feel like. So I feel like this um, being individual is eventually left to, to the individual themselves. I don't know, something like that. Yeah, that's... So, Miles, um, do you have anything you want to say on this? Uh, yeah. Wow. Um, first of all, with respect to Craig asking if you know anyone could critique or comment on these great authors that he listed, I would have to just say that I was I'm totally ill-equipped to be able to do that, and the reason for that is because. Um, I didn't, until early 2018, um, when I encountered Skip Conover in a comment in another YouTube channel, not his, his pastor's channel, he mentions, you know, Jordan Peterson, he's too heavy on the logos. So he's, Skip is saying that, in his opinion, Jordan Peterson is too much of a von Spate not enough foe. And, and he's, uh, Skip says, you know, you can't be logos all the time. You know, we have to remember the arrows. So that was tw early 2018 or late 2017. And I had no idea what the heck is he talking about arrows in that way. I had a very shallow, minimal understanding of arrows as just related to erotic, you know, sexual. Um, and so, but anyway, I was intrigued, so I followed Skip. And just to put it into context, you know, the reason I'm wearing orange is I'm in Canada, and I think the whole world's probably heard about the so-called residential schools that operated from 1875, well, basically from Confederation, the uh, Canada became a nation uh, in 1867. And then they started to basically uh, roll across the, from the east to the west, the, the settlers um, uh, to, you know, take over the, the country, which was supposed to be, is, is to be done by treaty. Okay, so um, where, you know, and those treaties are supposed to be an honorable treaties, but obviously, um, 
this uh, power uh, craving took took over, and uh, you know, love was lost, and uh, and then they created these so-called residential schools, which were indoctrination camps, um, government sanctioned, operated by a number of churches, and there. Um, th so uh, this is very powerful to me because in the in in 2015, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission came out with their report, 5,000 pages of testimonies from Indigenous people about how damaging these residential schools were. So let's not call them residential schools, let's call them indoctrination camps. And so um, 2015, I thought this was horrible. I didn't many, many Canadians would say we were never taught any of this. We didn't, you know, it's kind of like being you know, in, in, in any other country where there's been a Holocaust done. And, you know, some people would say we weren't aware of it. Well, now we're aware of it and we have to attend to it. So there's calls to action. And why is this conversation so important to me is because I, I chose back in 2015 or thereabouts to take on call to action 49, which is, I'll read it to you. We call upon, uh, we call upon all religious denominations and faith groups who have not already done so to repudiate concepts used to justify European sovereignty over indigenous lands and peoples, such as the doctrine of discovery. So what young and you know, thank you to Craig and others uh, by sharing this, are continually to reveal to me is why, um, what these concepts are that have been used to um, you know, abuse power, people abuse power, uh, take over lands in a dishonorable way. Um, not, not working in parallel with others. And, you know, that's, this concept of parallelism is a new one to me, but I think it relates to what Craig said earlier, and that is that we all seem to have some issues with respect to, many of us have issues or an ill feeling about religion. And I think, Craig, you said that what Jung is saying is that ultimately we're all our own religion in a way. We all have a unique perspective, a unique window on God. And that's, um, you know, we're, we need to do an, undertake the individuation journey. And so live in parallel as individuals, like we are here, and then um, actually read the Bible with the lens of this wholeness, you know. So let me conclude. Uh, yesterday, um, a, a scientist who works with the heart was on Skip's channel, and Elizabeth Taylor, PhD. She's a specialist in the actual functioning of the heart, but she became a Jungian, and um, she talks about the the Holy Spirit as feminine. And indeed, um, the, if you go into ancient religion, uh, ancient scriptures in the ancient languages of like, Aramaic, the pronoun for the Holy Spirit is feminine. But if you go to BibleGateway.com, and I've done this, not a rigorous formal, you know, research into it, but you could verify if I'm wrong, but BibleGateway.com has, I think, about 30 translations of the Bible. There's only a couple that at best present the Holy Spirit as um, neutral. Uh, I'm not even sure if there's, there might be one that presents the Holy Spirit as feminine. So I'll conclude by saying 
you know, at some point in the past 2000 years, um, the, the power, the von Spates sort of took over the Bible, I would present or hypothesize. And uh, consequently, um, you know, it would explain why there's been such a patriarchal creation in, in the, many of the today's modern versions of Christianity. So um, I'll just conclude by saying, you know, so, so much of this is very helpful to me in uh, yeah, what mean, I'm working. Sorry. It, it sounds like it was sort of the, uh, the collective shadow that sort of started you uh, on this path to just so that you could see things and, you know, do the discernment yourself. How about you, Arpine? Would you like to uh, make a comment? Yes, it was very interesting for me, uh, the presentation as always. And um, I learned a lot of things. It was interesting to know about the power and love in unconscious and uh, the totality and normality aspects and many other things. Um, uh, I mean, uh, normal ten madness, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jordy. Um, would you like to comment? Is Jordy still with us? I don't know. He might have gone away. Oh, oh, uh, he's in the waiting room. I think he just came in. Oh, okay. How about he's, you, Tim? Well, I'm sorry. Oh, there's Jordy. Go ahead, Jordy. Oh, Jordan, you want to go ahead and comment? Yes, sorry, but I had an issue with the laptop. Just a precision point concerning Jordan Peterson. Uh, he's heavy on, on logos, as any scholar is. To some extent, Jung himself uh, worked hard not to be over, over logic. Now, the ways to deal with the errors, the playful, the love, uh, whatever that means, or the, the, whatever the, the layer of meaning, uh, is approaching a different way and uh, had been many moons after Jung on that, not coming most of them from, from academia. Now, I, I understand that uh, Jordan Peterson as a topic of debate, it, it's a tricky one and it's difficult to have a, a balance. I mean, he's not perfect. He got saliency for uh, a specific position with the University of Toronto, which by the way, I fully support from a very di the distinct perspective. I am much more on the left of his political position generally, mm -hmm. but he was right there. And he was right to fight. Now, uh, he's too candid in showing his family around, which is, I think, it's something you better do not. And that's uh, that sort of entertaining. Uh, on, the, on the plus side of Peterson, his biblical lectures are, are interesting. You find them on YouTube, on the psychology of religion. Uh, you can go. You can go, of course, much further than that, but it's it's a sort of a present. It's a very good starting point for ninety percent of the people. And his book of, of map of, of meaning, his PhD thesis, is interesting as well. Now, it's remarkable that someone whose background is basically basically on experimental psychology went as far as trying to understand Jung. And the world will be better if there were many more people interested in Jung coming from other fields. Uh, I am not a member of the Peterson fan club, but again, uh, trying to be somewhat balanced. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I mean, uh, Peterson can be accused of misogenesis, Jan, but uh, all of the males here for similar reasons can be accused of horrible things, I mean. Uh, being a Mesa, uh, Mesa, how do you say in English? Mesa, get Genesis? Mesa. What, yeah, 
mis, mis, misogynist, misogynist. misogynistic or misogynist. It's, it's a very specific way of being an asshole, to make the story short. And of that, your highness, I declare myself guilty. Could I just add, just interject something else I wanted to say, and that is that um, uh, what I think we need to wake up to is that corporations, the massive corporations, multinational corporations, uh, even, you know, I'm using Google and Gmail and all these things. These corporations are all logos, pretty much. Um, so you, I just thought of how you could, and, and you need to be logos. Uh, so I used to work for a railroad um, and that's very logos. You've got to follow the rules precisely, right? Not to have trains crashing into each other. As opposed to say the Burning Man event. I don't know if any of you Americans have been to Burning Man. I've never been, but that's sort of the opposite end. That'd be the foe, you know? So foe would be Burning Man, Von Spate would be a railroad corporation. And uh, the, 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 there is a need though to, to as the, we're learning that the wholeness lies in being somewhere in, the, in between, you know, to have balance in the world. Yeah, let's go ahead and finish uh, going around. Uh, Tim, do you want to make a comment? Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the discussion. I have a church uh, obligation that I'm struggling with, but um, I did want to respond to the, to the business of the, the artist's inspiration because, you know, my life is subsumed in that. And just for me, it feels to me like my inspiration comes from outside. And I realize that technically, this is just a part of my unconscious that I can't access in, in normal circumstances. And I call this figure my muse. It's a feminine figure, very much like what Jung responded to, what much of art history shows us in, in the psyches of men. And it's really helpful for me to just think about this as a goddess, a real entity who lives outside me somewhere that every so often is constellated in my environment, usually in the form of some woman that floats through my, my environment. And if I can take advantage of that moment and, and lock in on that appearance, I can access the, the wisdom of my muse. And so oftentimes, uh, you know, somebody just comes through on their bicycle or, or um, you know, I run into somebody in the coffee, coffee shop and I can tell that my muse is constellated. And so I, I get into this state, this creative state, and I can go back to my studio and all kinds of stuff pours out. Um, it's an, um, it's an, a magical situation. And I think this is really available to all of us that we have this capacity to, to tap into it. And it's really fascinating to me that Jung is able to parse this for us and say, yeah, this is, these are the mechanisms and this is what's happening. And this is what happens in men. And this is what happens in women. Um, and for me, it's just absolutely fascinating to watch this process from both the, the inside and the outside and be able to compare them. So anyway, uh, it's a fascinating discussion. Thanks. Yeah, I just, I love that description you just gave, Tim, because I think, you know, that really this, this goes back to personification. So, you know, if we see something in our environment and if we can then, you know, personify it and begin this whole thing of relatedness, then, you know, then it can, it, we can get into the, you know, the emotional aspect, the affect. And, and then, you know, with that affect, it's, it's like, you know, it's like we're doing an, an act of imagination. And with that act of imagination, you know, we can pull in things that we just, we wouldn't have access to otherwise. I mean, that's, 
that's kind of that's the process that that I kind of feel happens. Um, and you know, I know for me the the journey is really, you know, been one of trying to find more relatedness. You know, I think you know, kind of like more more soulfulness, more connection to the earth. And I think uh, you know, and this this whole story and the and the discussion we had today just really reminded me of it. Carlos, would you like to make a comment? Are you there, Carlos? If, if so, you're muted. Nope. Okay. Um, so, Jan, I could, I don't, you know, you, you don't, I, I'm going to just look at some of your stuff here. Let's see. Or, well, I see there's a new message. Um, okay. So, I'm going to read Jan's last comment. I listened to Peterson for a while, but he was really just mirroring J Joseph Campbell's J ideas as if they were his own. Then he sort of got drunk on his own ego, I feel. <laughs> Add to that, his desire for followers and adherence and his conservative bet. Okay, we do not have a Peterson fan here, folks. <laughs> but, you know, I, you know some, somewhere along the line, you know, Jan, we're going to have to talk her into giving a, a presentation on, um, you know, on some of the of her take. On, Sand on, play on, or whatever. Well, yeah, that I'm, is, all, I'm all for that. She is just full of, of good stuff. I would well, love to. Her. Yeah, at least a PowerPoint or something. Maybe if she wants to just do a powder PowerPoint. You know, I just uh, yeah. say, too, about Peterson. I mean, though, the, he's very knowledgeable, but like I... I he's no James Hillman, you know, I mean, he's just, I, I say the, the thing about him is that, uh, you know, he tries to bring too much socio uh, aspect into it. You know, uh, the, the, now I'm just saying that in the Taoist realm, you know, Jung is supposed to be closest to Taoism, but you know, it's, it's like the, uh, uh, I just keep thinking of the Taoist king who goes out to see what everybody thinks of him. And uh, everybody looks at him and says, we didn't know there was a king. And then he goes back into his palace happy because that was what he wanted to do, to have this natural realm, you know, of the, uh, I mean, it, one of our uh, real distortion aspects is, modern day is these mega civilizations and all its political aspects. Now compare that to the, to the Lakota Sioux and uh, uh, you know, uh, th th there's just that aspect that uh, Jordan Peterson has that is not really true to the Jungian spirit, you know, which would be more in favor of the cave painters and the Lakota Sioux and the, uh, uh, and the uh, schools, uh, not having the schools that Miles spoke of, you know, and let's let's be informed by our dreams, you know, uh, a little bit. Let me say one thing about Eros, too, and the feminine, okay? Now, this is just something that I've, that's come up in some dreams and things, you know, that I've had, is there is a, a, a quality of it that is human, and there's a quality of it that is is uh, is elemental nature, you know, and uh, the creative aspect that made this beautiful oak tree out here. I'm looking at, and these hummingbirds, and uh, these cardinals, is is also uh, an aspect of our own creativity, you know. I mean, the 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 thing is that the divine power that created the hummingbirds and the oak tree and the cardinal uh, are also in uh, us, you know, and it's a sense of play and everything. So, um, uh, you, you know, the one thing uh, is, is there is a non-human aspect to it. And yet it, it seems to take so much joy in uh, now suddenly having a medium of expression of words, of rhythm and meter, of 
colors and art and also uh, verse and all of this stuff. I think it's doing the same thing with these mediums that it did with the hummingbird and with, with the cardinal and the, the other aspect to us. Now we are man and woman too. You know, I'm always, I, I always really enjoy people who, who think that they're man or woman by accident of birth, you know, and, and even that the aspect of me as a male is that I lack, I, I'm conscious of only the male side, you know, but I, I didn't ask to be conscious of only the male side. It's just the way I grew, you know, and so now I need the feminine side too. But the feminine side is life too, not just the girl. You know, there is, it, it, there's a symbolical aspect to it that is nature and life, where I represent uh, more of the, that aspect that's detached from earth, that's not rooted. Remember that uh, diagram that, um, that she had that is, is really very uh, illustrative of, of, of logos and eros. Oh, I'm gonna shut up after I'm going on too much, but uh, this, uh, let's see if I can get that up again here, to show the difference between the world of, uh, of, of uh, the, you, you, know, you know, the stars, the celestial aspect of, of, of the constellations, the firmament, permanent and, and you know, ordered, ordered realms, spiritualization, some type of, uh, uh, and the power and order. Uh, the ghosts, I'm not too clear about. But then on the other side of Eros, this, this is what differentiates, you know. And then on the other side is what brings together. And that is nature and nurturing and the mother, the rooted aspect, the body, and that growing thing. So Eros is related to all four of those things. You know, the growing aspect. My wife is just coming home with her second puppy, you know, and she's just an earth mother. She's interested in the bodies and animals, the wisdom of the body. This is something that I greatly lack. The rootedness of, of the trees and the earth where I'm detached from the earth. And then that aspect of, of the mother which we know is not just the physical mother, it is the, um, it's that aspect of, of uh, what, where the life force that animates all beings, where it all, we all came from, you know, but then uh, you got this other side. So I don't know. I mean, I just say it's, uh, um, now the, what, uh, I guess that, that I'm just adding that to uh, uh, what, informs art, I think, but, you know. You know, for, for where we go to from here, Craig, maybe maybe we could get some input from people on this too, but, you know, the last two, you know, books that we've done, I've really liked because it's almost like, it's almost like storytelling around the campfire. It feels mm -hmm. very much, it has a mythological aspect. And, you know, you know, so it makes it really easy to identify with the characters and see, you know, some of the things that they're going through and, and see it in our own lives. So their uh, case histories somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what I really liked about the living symbol with Gerhard Adler. It, it was, uh, first of all, nobody, he's, a, he's an unsung hero. He, nobody knows more about Jungian psychology than Gerhard Adler. You know? And yet he, through the living symbol, he gives us all these case, this case history, which is just absolutely phenomenal, you know, dreams, visions and everything else. But yeah, I mean, the, the idea, I think the only thing is Anima and Animus is just a very short book, you know, but uh, I, anyway, why doesn't everybody put in some suggestions for books? You know, if, if we do them a lot, uh, if we do them very, very well, they do take some time. You know, uh, I don't, I tend not to just want to read 50 pages and then just have a non-generic conversation about it and then put the next 50 pages in. You know, I mean, you don't get anywhere that way, but uh, 
yeah. But yeah, anyway, I'm until open we can to develop, any. Uh, until we can develop kind of a, a feeling, you know, it's all, you know, if it's just in the intellect, it's just sort of in and out. So, yeah, you know, the, I agree the, with what you're saying. It, and I think that's what you do so well is that you really do, you know, you're able to pull in so much additional material. That, well, that, you know, Gerhard Adler uh, and Living Symbol and then Visions by Young. I, and then here's another one, um, the uh, alchemy, which is the dreams of, uh, of um, uh, the, who's the, uh, uh, he's the physicist. What's his name? Bohr or? Um, yeah, Paul, no. Who? Talking about Pauli? Yeah, oh, Pauli. Yeah. And uh, uh, that, those are fabulous dreams. And then another volume just came out of that, which I, I've got on PDF too. It was a seminar just on Pauli's dreams, you know, uh, rather in alchemy, it's just young talking about him. In this one, it's, it's a seminar on Pauli's dreams, which might be fun. He had the greatest dreams ever, you know, and it just, uh, it just came out this year, I think, or last part of last year, you know, so, you know, I, maybe I can send uh, some PDFs of some suggestions and uh, we just, kind of uh, vote on it you know oh, that, I'll, I'll, that's well, a good idea I like that yeah I'll put in uh, just a few books and then let's just uh, 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 vote on it and and we'll uh, uh, go with that that's good thank you Tim and and you know uh, and plus give me some or give any suggestions because I get PDFs of anything but I'd say visions and living symbol would keep us going for like five years but but the book on on Pauly might just take us a few months to do, you know, and it's a lot of dream. You'll see Young in, in that book, uh, you know, uh, what, what uh, Carrie Baines says, he speaks with fire. You know, there's this aspect when he's doing seminars that he doesn't, he acts like I'm not being recorded here so I can say anything I want, you know, but anyway. Uh, I'd just like to add <clears throat> something. Um, with respect to uh, today's discussion and uh, how I'm I'm working on these concepts that are keeping us stunted, you know, the indoctrination concepts that we've all, many of us have been under. And uh, I wrote down, or I should I'd rather say we wrote down because when I was, the, these are not mine, they're generated while I'm listening to to the conversation and to Craig, so I really don't like using I. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, I won't I won't read those, but I have a number of them. What I want to point out is I added a video. Uh, Craig, you you brought up uh, the importance of listening to people like the Lakota and what is the name of the tribe in Labrador that you've often Nascapi. brought up? The Nascopi. the Nascopi people. Oh, that book is just so good. I mean, they, they, there are people who their whole religion is just what dream somebody had last week. You know, I mean, and, you know, they, then they spend all this time drawing pictures, acting it out, you know, and, uh, you, you know, and then the shaman and everybody's trying to, I mean, they're just, it's a religion of, of dreams. And, you know, when I mentioned how today's mega corporations, transnational corporations are all von Spate, all logos all the time. T to compare that to the way the indigenous people will approach a project and compare and contrast. Uh, for example, it's very common that when they're going to undertake a project that they will begin with um, with a smudge, burning of sweet grass. They'll begin with song and story and ceremony, you know. And soften, soften and, and quiet the, the ego. See, the, the, wrong, the problem, problem with the, that, those corporations and those people who wanted, who through good intentions, wanted the Indian children to assimilate into what they thought was the highest form of civilization which was, yeah. you know, Canadian, uh, European uh, uh, civilization uh, going to schools and stuff, is who is their God? It's ego. You know, I mean, we're in the, in the dying age of Pisces, 
where, where now the God of our age is ego consciousness. There is what no just other like, higher form of, of, just of. Add that in the comments, I posted a link to a very recent Indigenous Elders Campfire chat. And it features Reg and Rose, Rose Reg and Rose Crowshoe. Mm-hmm. And I'm part of this Indigenous Gathering Place Society. I volunteer. And so I was part of smoking their thunder pipe for truth. And to be a volunteer, to be, you know, um, in, incorporated as a, an, a volunteer, and and then there's also um, former chief Lee Crowchild uh, featured as well, and I've exchanged some letters with Chief Lee Crowchild, and it's the the video is a campfire chat, and it talks about this concept of theirs. And I'll try to say the name, the word correctly, itapotop, which means a place to rejuvenate and re-energize during during a journey. Uh, you know, so this um, I would suggest that you know what we have, are realizing is that sure Jung came up with you know he's put it down in paper, but there are people that have you know this this is just actually common to us within us right this uh, this individuation it's subtitled together in a good way a journey of transformation and renewal indigenous strategy i just invite people to watch that or if anyone's well, listening you can just go to university of calgary web's uh, youtube channel and you'll find it there can you imagine uh, and jordy might be able to speak to is what, what you call a mondo or something i mean you'd uh, you'd meditate for 90 minutes, the group would all be in deep meditation for 90 minutes. Then after that, when they came out of it, now let's talk, you know, you're, you're not ready to talk until, and you know, Young would tell people who came to Bollingen, they had to spend a week in the forest before they could come and visit him, you know? Yeah. I mean, the, the whole idea is, uh, you, you know, like if we were to start this class with just 30 minutes of meditation and then talk, you know, I mean, I, I think say, the topics would be different. I know? will say one week is not that much. Yeah. Yeah. I one week say. is not that much. <laughs> I will say more 10, 12 days. Yes. Uh, the standard fare will be uh, tw- three weeks, 21 days. Yeah. The, having, you, you the know, having the privilege of having team say, uh, conspicuous uh, artists here. If I can drop a couple of ideas concerning er- Eros versus Logos and active imagination, uh, I will say that Eros has two dimen- has many dimensions. One is relatedness, another, another one is play, playfulness. Now, if we go to the scientists, which is a world I know, they have some sort of erotic freakness. If you look to the history of chemistry, for instance, the development of organic chemistry, the, car- the carbon rings, etc., cetera, benzene, etc., they had some sort of epiphanies. They went to sleep, uh, say, after the opera or some sort of cultural thing, and they had their eureka moments. The same for physicists. Now, if we go to the art, all of you are familiar with Picasso or Miro or these uh, 20s to 60s artists. They had the, the idea of going back to the child attitude to creativity, which on second thought has a, almost a Christian religion dimension. To that youthful aspect oh, of signaling some sort of uh, false individuation doing uh, in adulthood. Yeah, the I child say, is to be I, the. I will say, Ralph, Ralph wouldn't disagree here, Jeffrey Ralph, in yeah. a way. Yeah, the child is to be what's born of, of our very strength and ego and our relationship with the anima. 
you know yeah. i mean that that's supposed to, i think i'm just that's sort of my yeah yeah it is the it's that that is the cha is the is the new birth you know uh but uh he, he, i want to talk about two things it, it one thing is I, this guy I knew me, michael harner whenever he wanted to have a discussion on he was trying to you, you know do shamanism he would go into a cave with his people for like you said 10 to 12 days everything they didn't leave the cave now the the idea was eros nature life you know and and the the cave is the where we were all born yeah but, uh, yeah now, uh, back to the, the, the politics, and I know that uh, Miles and Gary have some interest here. Uh, everything related to Eros, playfulness and gladness is not commercial. It's not for business. The best that, say, the corporate West can do is to invent Las Vegas or Netflix or things like that, trying to grab a, a dollar out of that and be, keep us being passive. That is a, a, a regressive force because I mean, if you are one practice I recommend is dancing, for instance. At the beginning of the talk, when you put the first schema on, on power, I say, well, concerning errors and power, you have tango. Kevin, go ahead. Kevin, why yeah, I just wanted to word? make yeah, I just wanted to make a quick comment because I I also observe uh, something what uh, Jordi says, like because when I see at stadium like uh, sports, I feel like they unite opposites. Like there is a battle going on, but by the end of the game, whether you know the country are really a sort of a war with each other, there is after the game there is a release of tension, and you can see they hug. They will never hug in real life, but because they have had this release of tension uh, in the playing field. Mm -hmm. So I, I always had a thought: if we didn't have sports, how much, much like how much more war? Would uh, would we have even Olympics? It is that tension after the game is just unbelievable. And the tension, not after, but the one that's that's going to the last second or whatever it is. Well, uh, does anyone else want to have the last word? Or Gary, how don't talk about you? No, I think I'm good. You know, I'm <laughs> like, what's okay. this is well, a good discussion. Yeah, I think either last time we'll try to finish chapter 12, but I... It, why don't we try to keep with people who are close to young? That so that would be Hillman, Edinger, uh, people like that. You know, uh, uh, von Franz, Adler, uh, Barbara Hanna, anybody that was sort of close to young. You know, and I'll put a bunch of examples or suggestions, and you guys give some more. But uh, some, go ahead, Jordy. Uh, following the chat. Doing a couple of monographic sessions on animus anima. Yeah. Well, yes. The, the, I, mean, I would say anima, that anima and women. It, it, it may be interesting and educational for all of us. It's a very short book, too. I mean, we we could yeah. probably do it in, in two to three to four sessions. It's uh, by Emma Young, and it's it. it yeah. If we ever really want to know, we we want to be educated what the anima is and what the animus is. It, it's, it wouldn't take us very long. And then, but I'll put it out there and then we'll just see. But that would be a very short book. I think it's maybe 60 to 80 pages, you know, so. Anyway, well, thank you uh, so much. And then I'm gonna send that Polly book out too. Uh, that might be a fun one. You know, I, 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 some of the other ones I was mentioning were kind of boring, you know, like let's talk about Saludio. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, thanks, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next time. I really appreciate it. My dog always knows what this means when I say that. Oops. He's ready for a walk. He's going nuts here. When I say thanks, everybody, <laughs> that's suddenly the, the thing. Okay. Well, we'll see you guys all later. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.